Testing, testing. Okay. I hope you guys had a nice lunch. So, without further ado, telling you a few, a, ve a lot of interesting tidbits about analyzing Linux kernel crash dumps. Marian! Marino! Yeah! <laughs> Did you all read this? This is what we are doing tonight, today. <laughs> tonight also. <laughs> so, uh, who am I? Uh, half of the room knows me, so for the other half. Uh, I'm the sleepy person that uh, works for SiteGround. I'm their chief architect and also obviously helping with OpenFest and some other conferences. Uh, I would not lose you more time. I do Linux for 20 years now. So, uh, what I'm going to talk is uh, two things. First, how to get crash dumps. And the second is uh, how to actually read them. Uh, first of all, uh, there are a lot of ways to get the crash dump. Uh, you can firstly, before you reach the crash uh, situation, uh, analyze your oops and panics on serial console or net console. Also, there are uh, kernel message uh, dumpers uh, known as uh, RAM oops and MTD oops. And we can uh, think about uh, KDUMP, PSTOR, NVRAM. I'll talk about this later. First, serial console. There is an issue with serial console and it's uh, the limit of the cable. Uh, RS, uh, 232, okay, <laughs> uh, is limited, uh, I think, 12, 20 meters, something like this. So uh, we don't get uh, a lot of uh, coverage if uh, the machine breaks here and we don't have a machine within 20 meters we are generally fucked. Uh, it's also not uh, so widespread, so mm, you don't have uh, serial console on uh, all machines. Uh, most of the machines, uh, normal machines, not servers, uh, don't have serial support in their BIOSes. In uh, servers, however, you have uh, serial console, but uh, usually uh, you're uh, switching this to the IPMI interface, so, sorry. Okay, so uh, when you uh, connect, you, when you try to connect to the serial interface, it's already taken by the IPMI. So you don't have access there. Net console is something else. Something that uh, if we had yesterday with Marwa, we at least would know what happened uh, without waiting for, I think, 15 minutes before uh, we understood that Marwa crashed. So uh, what it does is uh, it utilizes the network stack and uh, sends uh, all of your kernel messaging uh, directly via UDP to another machine. If you compile this as a module, uh, you can simply uh, reconfigure this uh, while the machine has uh, booted. If uh, it's statically compiled in your kernel, uh, you can configure it only on boot, so if you change the IP of the receiver, you have to reboot the machine. So uh, there are another, uh, other issues like if the problem with the kernel is within the networking code, you wouldn't, wouldn't be able to send the message to the network or with uh, the network driver. So, uh, okay. Oops, no. Okay, PSTOR. Uh, this is since, uh, I think, 2008, they started uh, working on this. The idea is that you have memory on your machine, and this memory can be used to store uh, the crash dump or the oops messages or the panics. Perfect. Unfortunately, when you power cycle your machine, uh, the memory is wiped. Um, or is it? <laughs> uh, most of the BIOSes simply don't clean the data uh, in your memory. So uh, if you reserve a memory segment and tell the kernel that it shouldn't write there at all, un unless it is using this driver, the memory actually stays the same. So after reboot, you can read that. Uh, this is uh, some... This is tricky. This you can use on your local machine that uh, doesn't have uh, 
ACPI platform uh, error interface where it doesn't have uh, UFI, uh, it works most of the time. <laughs> if uh, this doesn't work for you and you have uh, any of these two technologies on your machine, uh, it's pretty easy because the UFI actually allows you to store data in the BIOS. Uh, small pieces of data, but you can actually store it there. Uh, also, mm, the same goes with the AC ACPI uh, platform in, uh, error interface. It allows you to store certain amount of data uh, in persistent memory. By persistent, uh, think of it like uh, the BIOS itself, uh, additional non-volatile memory uh, that you have on the uh, main board on this machine. Uh, the problem with pStore is that it relies on uh, specific drivers for your uh, platform, so if your motherboard doesn't have the needed uh, hardware, uh, you cannot use this, and the only, the only thing that you can use is your uh, current memory. Uh, it's uh, available in the mainline kernel since uh, 2010. It works. Uh, most of the Android devices are actually using this for storing their crash dumps and uh, recovering the information from there. So how can you check if uh, you actually support uh, uh, pStore, persistent storage? It's very simple. Compile it in your kernel, and when you boot, you should get uh, something like this uh, registered uh, ERS, uh, ERST, or uh, here it would be uh, the UFI interface. Uh, how to use it? You simply mount the file system. This is a generic file system that uh, interacts with the UFI and the API, <laughs> the ACPI there. So um, when you mount it, if there is something stored in the UFI or the ACPI interface, you get files. Uh, these files are in chunks, usually around 10, uh, 10 kilobytes, and you read those, and there is your uh, panic or oops or actually crash dump. So uh, how this works is actually like this. Uh, after you mounted this, uh, you get these files there. And when you cut uh, some of the files, you actually can see part of the oops message there. And oh, here is the function that crashed here. And we don't use uh, other storage uh, other than our memory. Next time the kernel boots, it will see this. Once you mount uh, again the uh, file system, uh, you get this. You have to remove these files because the storage is very limited. So every time you when you boot, uh, usually you get a script that copies all of, moves all of these files to some persistent storage like your hard drive or the network. Uh, it depends on your setup. If you have any questions, stop me right now. It's easier. <laughs> okay. So uh, what else? We have uh, RAM oops. Uh, RAM oops and uh, empty and empty dupes uh, actually uh, supported mechanisms of uh, pStore. Uh, this is why I started talking first for pStore, uh, because uh, the idea here is to use uh, to utilize with RAM oops the actual memory that you uh, that you have. The only thing required for RAM oops is uh, ECC registered RAM, and it should work. Since uh, 2011, uh, we have it in the mainline. Actually, it started, uh, uh, the guy started developing it uh, parallel with uh, pStore and uh, then decided to wait first for uh, pStore to get uh, to the mainline and then uh, to include RAM loops. Uh, MTD is uh, memory technology devices are mm, different type of memory that is uh, usually mm, existing on uh, systems on chip. And this memory uh, sometimes, most of the times, uh, is non-volatile. I mean that uh, it wouldn't uh, lose its state after reboot. So uh, they are usually, again, limited in space, but a lot bigger than uh, the UFI or the ACPI interface. So you can use those if you have them on your machines. So if you are with something like ARM, uh, most, uh, most probably you have uh, MTD device that you can use for uh, 
your your oops and uh, panics. There are things that I'm not going to talk much about is uh, NVRAM. Non-volatile RAMs are uh, chips that you have on some of your um, main, board, uh, main boards. Uh, you don't have them on all of them. But if you have, you have a device called uh, Dev NVRAM and you can use it directly uh, to do this. Also, there are drivers. Uh, currently, I'm not sure that, are, that they're in the stable kernel, but drivers that uh, hook up your NVRAM devices directly to your PStores. So uh, you access them through the PStore file system uh, directly. Uh, the other thing is machine check exception, exceptions. Uh, uh, mainly we get uh, error detection from there. We cannot store anything, but uh, these are stored on uh, each device and you can pull them uh, after you reboot. So each device actually stores uh, error messages from it uh, that it generated it generated so we are continuing with uh, k dump this is the de, de facto standard for uh, dumping information from the kernel first here uh, it shouldn't have dependencies, but uh, unfortunately, it's not fully fully supported under uh, of kernels older than uh, 2.6. And people here would think, oh, 2.6, uh, it's so old, like 10, 20, uh, 12 years old. Uh, actually, there are a lot of people that are still using this kernel uh, in production. So uh, for them, uh, some of the things that I'm talking about are no options at all. So. Uh, Let's say that we are with a fairly recent kernel, above three, and uh, it requires k-exec. What is k-exec? Does anyone know here? Two, three people? Okay, then I'll explain. Uh, k-exec is uh, a mechanism in the kernel that uh, you can uh, add a second, start a second kernel after you have booted your first one. So what you can do is uh, they're using this uh, mechanism to load the second kernel. Your first kernel already died for some reason. Uh, a driver blocked or uh, a processor, uh, something has broken uh, the software there. So what's happening is uh, the first kernel is uh, switching the instruction pointer directly to uh, the first address of the second kernel that is already uh, loaded in memory. So instead of rebooting your whole machine, you are actually loading another kernel. Uh, and with this kernel, you're booting uh, an uh, initRD, you know, a stripped version of OS, uh, with a few scripts. And these scripts do uh, a very simple thing. Uh, they copy all of your memory or the memory that you have defined to a persistent storage. Uh, we'll see a picture in a bit. So the KExec has uh, small issues with uh, architectures. It's not supported across all architectures of uh, the kernel, but for x86, uh, x86-64 and ARM, uh, I think everything is fine. Also with uh, PowerPC, uh, it works. Uh, what I mean by not so easy to uh, set up, you have to compile it in your kernel to have uh, k-exec. Uh, you have to reserve a memory region uh, for this new kernel. Uh, this was required uh, with uh, other versions, with f kernels uh, newer than four. Uh, the kernel directly checks the s uh, size of uh, your second kernel and allocates the memory directly. Uh, what else? The second kernel uh, is uh, a, a problematic when you have hardware issues. If you have hardware issues, most probably you wouldn't be able to load the second kernel to actually start it. Or uh, if you have memory corruptions, uh, they may corrupt the mm, uh, software in the second kernel and it will also die. So uh, kdump is not perfect, but it works most of the times. Uh, then kdump requires uh, additional scripts. These scripts copy the information from uh, dev uh, kcore. Dev kcore is uh, your the device that actually gives you access to the kernel memory directly. 
So uh, these scripts copy all of your uh, data from dev kcore and dev mem to your hard drive, depending on uh, what you have uh, selected in the configuration of these scripts. Uh, you can copy uh, the whole memory of the machine, but uh, if you have a lot of memory, like uh, a terabyte or uh, 512 or 256 gigabytes, this means so much memory have to be copied to persistent storage. You don't care if it is uh, the network, your local SSD drive or uh, SATA drive, but you care about the time it takes to copy all of this data, to write it on uh, your persistent storage. So if you have uh, half a gig of RAM, uh, uh, half a terabyte of RAM, uh, that's a problem for you. Uh, it would take a lot of time, like 15, 30 minutes. Uh, current tools that are available with KDump um, are still still single threaded. This means that uh, even though you have like uh, 80 cores on your machine, uh, you're using only one to copy the data to uh, your drives. Uh, there is work uh, to do it in uh, multi-threaded. Uh, currently, we didn't have any success with that. Uh, we haven't tested it in a while. Like uh, six months ago, it didn't work. Okay. Uh, the HP guys are working on this uh, for uh, a year now, uh, but they're very ad hoc, so they're not continuously working on that. Uh, so how does uh, this work? Uh, you have your first kernel here. Uh, the system crashes, uh, reaches a panic here, or uh, you intentionally crash the machine. That's also a valid situation. Then uh, if the kernel is uh, CAIXEC enabled, uh, what you have is uh, you're switching to the second kernel directly from uh, uh, your first kernel. And the second kernel uh, dumps uh, all of the information from uh, VM core to local drive remote disk storage, whatever. Uh, VM core, K core, and uh, MEM depending on what you have selected in these scripts here, dump, dump catcher. Uh, this is not the name of the script, but it was a nice graph that I found when uh, I was preparing the presentation. So it's a collection of three scripts. As I remember, uh, it's one uh, init script, uh, one configuration file, and the init script uses two more to uh, copy the data from uh, different locations in PROC. And it uses, uh, it used to use uh, CP directly, <laughs> uh, which uh, obviously is single thread. Then they decided to switch to DD that uh, can be uh, made to work uh, uh, multi-threaded. Or you can <laughs> directly SCP the file to somewhere. It's not a problem. Then, uh, the second kernel is uh, loaded after the machine crashed, but this also means that you cannot load a second kernel to simply continue working on your machine. Uh, so you would reboot the machine uh, after you copy all the data. Uh, not all drivers work perfectly after you boot with kdump because uh, uh, with uh, kexec, the problem is that uh, the drivers, uh, some of the drivers require that the BIOS initializes the hardware before them. And they simply skip the initialization step. And the device, if uh, the problem was, for example, with your uh, RAID controller, um, obviously it, it wouldn't work because it is not initialized again. And uh, you wouldn't be able to write to your local storage because the problem was with the RAID controller. It's not initialized. You don't have per persistent storage. Uh, the same goes for uh, network drivers. Uh, sometimes. Uh, they're not initialized uh, properly, and what's happening, you cannot use the network after that. Uh, you have to construct specific uh, init RD for uh, the KDump kernel. Uh, the KDump utilities, uh, usually on uh, normal distributions like uh, Debian or uh, CentOS, you have an init script for the KDump, and uh, every time you boot, and checks if you already have an init uh, RD for your current kernel for the KDump. And uh, if you don't, it uh, generates it on the fly when you boot. So this a little bit delays your boot, 
but at least automatically creates your uh, init RD for the KDEM. If you don't want to wait, uh, you can simply trigger the uh, init script uh, when you boot. So, uh, we'll go to the analyzing part now. Uh, any questions for now? Nice, okay. Uh, this is a kernel oops message. Uh, and I actually found that there is a very nice site that collects a lot of kernel oopses, kernelooops.org, that helped a lot with this presentation. So first, uh, for the people that haven't seen this, uh, it's very unlikely that you haven't seen it if you are using Linux for a while. So what you have here is uh, there is a problem, general protection filed on uh, CPU free. And uh, there is a list of modules in here, but since it's too large, I skipped it on the slide. <laughs> but uh, usually here is a list of all of the modules that are currently loaded for your kernel. Then uh, it says, okay, on CPU 4, uh, there was a process ID, this one. The comment was, uh, the comment was Ice Weasel. The kernel was tainted. Uh, we'll talk about tainting uh, in a bit. The kernel was version this, and it was running on Debian. Uh, hardware was uh, gigabyte. Car, uh, mainboard, this module, uh, model, and the BIOS had this version. Then, the actual task, this is the pointer to the uh, task struct for this uh, particular process. And uh, this gives you more information about the task. And the important part here is the instruction pointer where uh, it all crashed. Uh, this is the function that uh, broke. And this is from the start of the function. This is the offset that uh, you go to. Uh, so uh, the other thing that I want to mention is uh, the code segment here. Uh, I'll stop by by the code segment in a bit. Just take a look at it. <laughs> So uh, after those lines, you have also these lines here. Uh, this is the situation of your stack at the moment. And there is a call trace. What is a call trace? It's uh, uh, the path that took to the crash, uh, which functions were executed uh, for each line in each function. It tells you uh, where it was uh, executing. Uh, this is the actual code that uh, was used, and uh, you see again here the instruction pointer. Now, uh, this all is a little bit too much to mm, parse every time that uh, you have a problem. So there is a very old tool, uh, old, old. Uh, I think it's uh, 2003 or 2004 when they introduced this. So this is a tool that uh, parses uh, this information. Uh, the oops or panic message also gets information from your system map file, uh, KSIMS file, and KCore file uh, to get information for each function. And uh, it, the information of uh, its assembly instructions from uh, VM Linux. And it produces a better. Uh, Sorry, I forgot to put uh, the slide with it. Uh, a better, easier format for humans to read, not for kernel developers. So uh, it gives you only the stack trace, uh, the call trace, and uh, it gives you the functions that uh, were responsible for the crash. It also is uh, used for preparing a crash report for the kernel guys to simply get this file shoot it on the mailing list and say, okay, there is a problem with this kernel, it doesn't work on my machine, it breaks it, and so on. So uh, once, we have, once we knew the function here, uh, this is dlookup uh, rcu, uh, we need to find that function. Uh, I know that this function is in uh, the name i.c uh, file. Uh, how I know this? Uh, because I did that. Uh, I looked for that function, or part of it at least, uh, in, in the Linux kernel. And you, you are asking yourself now, uh, why look up fast? The function was completely different. Uh, go back, go back. Okay. So I'll stop by here. Uh, 
this was the function that uh, triggered the oops, but this was the last function in the call trace here. So I took this function here and not the last one because uh, I'm not sure if really the last one was the problematic one. I first want to see the previous one. Uh, usually this is how you debug uh, the kernel. You don't always look uh, directly in the uh, last function. Uh, so I found the last last lookup uh, lookup fast function in this file uh, in the file system directory uh, name i dot c uh, and this is uh, the definition of the function. When I did the grep, uh, I actually found like maybe 20 or more lines. Uh, from those, I had to visually parse where the definition of the function was. And don't mistake uh, this with the hash files here. You need the C files, where the actual function is, where the code is. The definitions uh, in the uh, header files are uh, not relevant here. So uh, usually I keep my sources of the kernel uh, in uh, user source kernels. Uh, it depends on your uh, distribution, where your source would be, or if you have uh, built your kernel by yourself, it may be somewhere else. So uh, I did. The, I, I found that this is the file that uh, I had to open. Then I used GDB. GDB is uh, the normal debugger that we use for uh, C++ programs. And so what I did is uh, I opened the object file that is generated uh, from my build in the kernel. It stays in your directory until you do make clean. So. It's fine, it's there. So you have your object file, and I open it, and I use the built-in functionality in GDB to uh, get the information about uh, a function or a list of uh, linked list structure. And I give it a pointer, and this pointer is the name of the function plus the uh, offset. And if we go back again, uh, this is the offset from here that I'm copying. And when I give this, it tells me, okay, this function uh, is in this file, okay. And line uh, 1551 is the line that you are looking for. And obviously, that's exactly the line that I'm looking for because uh, it contains the function that was last called, okay? So we found this, we know that this is the uh, function and what we can do here is uh, start uh, checking the way back. So and for now we haven't used a crash dump, we have used only a compiled version of our kernel and the oops. This is important because uh, every time we start with the oops first and then uh, we go to the crash dumps. Uh, now, uh, with the crash utility. First, uh, I cannot stress enough that you have to use the crash utility that is the latest version. Everything below the latest doesn't work, uh, except this, because otherwise uh, yeah, you would lose uh, countless hours of uh, trying to find something that isn't there. Uh, it cannot show it to you, because simply they uh, add constantly patches to the crash utility that uh, introduces the functionality of how to grab this, how to grab that, uh, and if this information is not grabbed, there is no way actually for you to uh, get it directly, unless you code it like they did in the crash utility. Uh, you you must run the crash utility on the same architecture. So if you uh, have prepared a crash dump from a 64-bit uh, kernel, uh, you have to run the crash utility on a 64-bit kernel also. Uh, if you try to mix 32 and 64-bit architectures, it wouldn't work. It simply complains that uh, it can't un understand what you're trying to do. Uh, very helpful, the guys uh, from Red Hat, that, uh, that guy actually wrote the tool, uh, moved all of the help from, uh, exposed all of, the, all of the help of the crash utility via web pages uh, on his site, so it's very easy to uh, walk through it before you actually uh, start the utility. The same help you have in the utility itself. 
So uh, the most important comments that are uh, used uh, all the time uh, with in Crash, first is backtrace. Backtrace uh, gives you the information that uh, you saw in the call trace uh, in the OOPs. Uh, the idea is that you may not have the uh, OOPs or panic logged at all, but uh, the current, the crash dump, uh, the K dump utility, copied all of the memory of your kernel, so you actually have the uh, oops in the kernel uh, ring, ring buffer for uh, that's the ring buffer that is usually copied in uh, the DMSQL file. So you have this in memory. Uh, it is in your uh, crash dump that you have uh, written to your hard drive. And uh, the BT command actually from uh, the crash with you parses the uh, big file and finds this information from the ring buffer and gives it to you directly on the screen. This is the first thing. The second thing is uh, if you want to actually list the uh, contents of the, uh, the ring buffer, uh, you can do this by using the log command. Directly you get uh, the full log uh, as far as it is contained in the ring buffer. Uh, then there is another very useful command. If you want to see what processes were running on uh, your machine when uh, it crashed, you can actually use the ps command inside the crash utility and it gives you a process list of all processes, each process on uh, the, you will see in a bit. Okay, also uh, we get the files. Uh, if for some reason uh, you're debugging a crash that may be uh, triggered by a user space application, if you want to see all the files, uh, all the files that were opened by this process, uh, you simply uh, use the files command, give it the process ID, and uh, it gives you all the files and mounted file systems that uh, uh, it accessed. And uh, the one that I really like is what is. Uh, we'll see this uh, in a bit in the slides. What is gives you information about the structures uh, that you used. Uh, because it's very hard to, for, for example, I know that task struct is uh, the structure that uh, represents a process in, in a kernel, but uh, I don't know all the structures in the kernel. Uh, I reach a situation where there is a struct that uh, has a pointer, and I don't know uh, what's the structure that this pointer is pointing to, and what is can tell me this. So uh, you can actually automate some of the uh, crash debugging. Here uh, you can create a script that is uh, called uh, extract basic info, and these are the comments that you add there. Give me the back, uh, the backtrace. Give me the walk. Give me uh, the list of all processes. Exit and reboot. <laughs> uh, or uh, not reboot. Most probably you will send this information to your center of walk collector or stuff like this. Uh, you would actually execute crash like this. Uh, crash then VM Linux. Mm. VM Linux is uh, the basic uh, object file that you built before uh, archiving it to with gzip, uh, bzip, or uh, xz. Uh, this is the uncompressed version. Uh, newer versions of Crash uh, should work with uh, all compressed versions of the kernel, uh, but uh, we didn't have success with that. So. Uh, in my documentation in the office, this is how we run uh, Crash. The VM Linux uh, image is very important for you because there you get all the information of uh, what functions you have in this kernel. Then VM Core is the actual stored file that uh, a K dump created for you when uh, the machine uh, broke. And your... Um, piping the information from your script and uh, then piping the information from uh, crash to the report file and then you can use the, uh, the report file. So automatically to collect all the information that you need or most of it. So let's return to the uh, code segment part here. Uh, code segments are the most important thing about this is uh, the last digit here if it is uh, even the process that uh, crashed was in kernel space. If it is odd, 
it was in user space. Why this is important? Because uh, if a function that is usually a uh, uh, kernel space function uh, is executed in user space or uh, the other way around, a function that is usually uh, only learned executed in user space is executed in kernel space, uh, this directly gives you information that your memory most probably is corrupted or your CPU is corrupted for some reason. This shouldn't happen. And uh, this is very easy to detect uh, hardware problems. Based on this, uh, we have uh, replaced a lot of RAM and main boards. <laughs> Only uh, on this. Nothing else in uh, Doofs was important in that case. So uh, I know you don't uh, read this. Uh, so I tried to make it a little bit better but uh, still not possible. This is the call trace of another uh, crash dump uh, where the kernel panicked and here says, uh, not syncing, hard walk up, something. And this is uh, the call trace. Why I am showing the, fo the full call trace and not like uh, the previous loops, only a few lines, because the function that triggered the stupid dump, uh, the stupid crash, is uh, the first one over here. It's uh, infiniband uh, IP over infiniband multicast uh, function. Uh, why I know that? Because all of the, the others are uh, helper functions to actually reboot the machine. So. Uh, here's the actual call trace, now you can see it. <laughs> uh, here's the function that uh, broke the kernel, and everything else after that uh, was triggered by this function to reboot the machine. Uh, now, let's look at this. Again, we'll use uh, GDB to um, get the information, and we'll start the same way we, uh, we did uh, the, previous, uh, the previous time. Uh, first, we'll get... Uh, the function name from here, and then we'll try the same thing that we tried with GDB, and the list command simply tells us that there is nothing there. And most of us would say, okay, this doesn't work. Scrap it, no, try again. Uh, if you read a bit, uh, it tells you that it doesn't there, but uh, uh, the crash actually included some modules and in our case, these modules here, most probably this, this module is introducing this function. Since this is a module, it's not in the kernel uh, that we have at the moment for some reason. And we grab again for the function, we find it here in uh, this path. Here is the definition of the function. So we do the same thing with GDB. With GDB, we uh, use this file, the object file of this. Uh, we open it. Uh, we ask it to tell us uh, what's in there in the code. And here's the one that uh, broke. Uh, this is uh, 641, 641. Oh, I, I broke something here. It's uh, strange. Uh, I broke. I definitely broke something here when I pasted this because it's not this one. <laughs> yeah, it, it was supposed to be here. <laughs> uh, sorry, mm, I tried to arrange the slides to work on uh, so you can see it, um, but obviously I broke it. So you get the code this way and you get the correct line if you're not uh, mangling with the output. <laughs> Then, uh, if we need more information from the actual uh, core, uh, we can use uh, the commands. PS gives us information like this. All the uh, processes are listed. You get uh, the process ID, the parent uh, process ID, the CPU that actually is executing this, uh, uh, this process. And if this process is currently executing in the, C in the CPU, then here we would have uh, uh, bigger, the sign for bigger, uh, this sign here. Uh, also, it gives us the address in this uh, VM core uh, for um, where is the start of the task struct for this process. Uh, now, um, the other things are not very important for me. This is the memory usage, uh, uh, virtual memory size, resources, uh, and actual comment. What? Uh, 
uh, percentage usage. Uh, the problem uh, virtual memory. Virtual memory, essentially. Uh, uh, virtual memory, it depends. No, it's not swap. OK, sometimes it's swap if you have swap. But if you don't have swap, on this machine we don't have swap at all. It's not this. It, no, it's uh, depending on how you have configured your kernel. Because you're configuring what you want uh, for the memory manager in your kernel, and it depends. Let's say, let's leave it at that and uh, discuss it after the talk, okay? Uh, it depends. It's not always swap. This machine doesn't have swap. If In you are general, correct, then this should be no, zero. Uh -oh. Virtual memory is not always 100% what, what you have. Virtual memory is n never what you actually use in the process, actually. Never. Uh, if you talk to the memory manager guys, they will explain that this virtual memory is collected based on statistics for some information, like shared memory, uh, shared uh, libraries, and stuff like this. Uh, since I have only four minutes, let me continue with the slides, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm not going to stop you. Okay. Uh, what is here on the pointer? It tells uh, unsigned long and nothing else. We're trying to print it. It doesn't give us anything. So uh, we see, OK, it's a task. Then uh, there is a comment uh, in Crash that is called task. So we will use that comment on uh, uh, this uh, process ID. And it gives us, again, the same address. But now it prints a structure, C structure that is task struct. And now we know that these all uh, uh, pointers there are to, uh, this type of structures. And we get uh, some pointers here. And like the credentials pointer here, we want to get some more information like who was the user that was uh, executing this uh, task at the moment. This is uh, the pointer that we will take. And uh, we'll ask with what is, what is the type of the cred uh, member of the task struct structure. And it tells, uh, tells me it's a struct that is called uh, cred. Wow. Nice. So uh, now we want to see what's in this structure to print uh, the information from there. And we say, OK, what is the struct? What con uh, what's, what's contained in the struct cred? This is the contain, uh, not the full information, but only what I wanted to show you. <laughs> so uh, then we use the struct command. Now there is a command struct. <laughs> yeah, bear with me, sorry. Uh, we use the struct command on the structure cred that is pointed by this pointer that we actually took from here. This is, I uh, can get the end, EC00, uh, EC00. And this is the information in the structure that we have. So now we know what was uh, the user there. Uh, this is the easy example. Uh, if you're very interested in this, I would be happy to uh, make a workshop in our office uh, about debugging kernels. And uh, we have a lot of uh, crashes that we can show. <laughs> uh, then uh, there are other comments that uh, you can still use. Uh, Sys shows you the information of the machine that actually generated uh, this crash. It includes the kernel version, the uh, a lot of other things I forgot. There are 10 lines there, but I forgot each one. <laughs> um, IPCs, uh, there is the shared memory, the uh, semaphores. Uh, you can list all of them, or you can add a uh, process ID uh, after the command, and it will give you uh, this information for this particular process. Uh, VM is the same for uh, the virtual memory. This means all the memory of the process uh, that the kernel knows of. This is what virtual memory uh, is meant in the kernel. Uh, it knows about a lot of information for the, uh, for the process. It, 
it also can, uh, if you use the dev command, uh, it will list all of the devices that you have currently uh, visible by the kernel. This is not mounted devices. Uh, these are uh, all the devices that the kernel can recognize. Uh, you have loaded models for that. Uh, it's good to actually read this book. Uh, and this is a very easy, uh, fast uh, crash course of uh, understanding the crash utility, and Dedo Imedo, and he's very good at that. <laughs> um, questions? Now. Actually, we have time only for one question, and all of the rest have to be taken in the hallway. So, one question. Who's gonna take it? Anyone? Okay. What I didn't uh, understand is why you were using GDB at all, since you can simply g g grab the file, get the, the function, the, the def definition, why bother encoding the objects and, and doing all that? Uh, sometimes it's easier to find the information you need in the smaller object file that you have uh, in the module. Also, mm, it should have all the information in your uh, KDUMP, uh, in your uh, VM core, the file that is generated by KDUMP. Unfortunately, you can uh, filter what information you want to copy from uh, your machine. Like, I have machines with 256 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, if I decide to copy that, first I have to have 256 gigabytes of storage for uh, each crash dump. And secondly, uh, I have to wait for that to be copied. Uh, I don't have uh, either the time uh, nor the, uh, the space for this. So I filter only the kernel memory. Uh, these are only the kernel structures. Obviously, I don't have the information for that module there. Unfortunately, I don't know why it's not there. But at least I know how to find that information without even having it <laughs> in the crash dump. That, that's why I showed you this. Uh, there are other examples that you can use this uh, situation. You have all the object code uh, compiled on your uh, machine where you build the kernel. So you have all the data there. That is the static information. And you need the dynamic information, the actual structures and their content from the kernel to link this information. <laughs> Uh, it's not straightforward. Uh, it's uh, problematic when you are using, uh, for example, networking, because some of the networking code tries to hide the information from you, <laughs> uh, simply to be faster. Okay, let's give Marianne a big round of applause. Thank you.